Yeah. So um, I have known Laura for a number of years um, and I know that she has a real passion uh, for sustainability um, and I'm sure she'll tell you a little bit about her journey herself um, but um, she studied in Dundee and then did a master's in sustainability in Edinburgh and is now working for Tear Fund Scotland uh, and is hoping <laughs> to be an ambassador for uh, COP26 um, if it actually makes it to Glasgow but I'm hoping it will do. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you are Laura as well and I know that Laura's journey with um, caring for the environment. I love this story and I'm sure she'll tell you a bit more about it, but it all started on a New Year's Day, walking along a beach in Scotland uh, and just finding all the rubbish that is on our beaches. And that kind of stimulated a journey, which no doubt you will tell us more about, Laura. Um, and I think this evening, um, she's going to have a particular focus on sustainable fashion, which will be interesting as all the charity shops begin to open up uh, next week and everybody <laughs> has the opportunity to visit uh, charity shops, but also to leave off all the stuff that we've been clearing out of our houses uh, over the last few months. So, Laura, can I hand over to you now uh, uh, and welcome, because this is our first kind of online event for Bearsden Festival. So we're all learning together here. Uh, so it's just lovely to have you here this evening and lovely to see so many faces. I'm not sure how many people we actually, 26 people we've got now, which is fantastic. So, Laura, you're very welcome. Thank you so much. And I feel we've got a couple of doubles as well. So I feel you can probably boost that number up. A wee bit um but it's great to be with you all and I was saying at the beginning I personally love online events I think they are fantastic I think it brings together people from so many different places I am a million miles away from you on the south side of Glasgow we're at opposite ends and um, so I'm glad I didn't have to make that journey all the way through and um, but of course I, I do love Bears Den and it's great to be with you all and this is a really kind of exciting and important day I feel that we're meeting because tomorrow we have World Earth Day so mm -hmm. turn on your radios tomorrow everyone is going to be talking about the environment everybody is going to be talking about COP and the things that we can do and um, I'll tell you a bit more about COP and all of that as well but you know this is a really important day because tomorrow the world is going to be focused um but one of the things we need to keep our eye out for is there is also going to be lots of information around about companies doing things that are green. So let's make sure we know if they're green. Um, and I'm going to chat a wee bit about that as well. But also this week is a week called Fashion Revolution Week. It's a week that happens every single year. And it's all about fashion, all about sustainable fashion, how we can um, campaign for a wee bit um, against fast fashion. And I'm going to talk about that as well. So it's kind of like a perfect storm. Um, everything seems to be coming together, but also because Glasgow is a really important city this year. This year, we are going to be hosting COP. This is the Conference of the Parties United Nations Climate Conference. Tomorrow, the US is hosting a Climate Leaders Summit to talk about climate change. And in June, we have the G7 in Cornwall coming to talk about climate change. So everybody seems to be talking about climate change, sustainability, the environment, and that's because it's really important. And it's really important because we are in this urgent state, probably because you're all here, you might already know a little bit about that. You might care a little bit, but maybe you're not sure how to act on that as an individual or push around. One of the things I'd love to do over the next, I'm looking at the clock, what, see when the clock is seven minutes past my math goes out the window because I only work in tens but for the next half an hour or so I'll guess I'll be chatting to you and actually a conversation is the way that we can learn together and ask questions please do use the chat function throughout or if you have a question pop it in there if you think you might forget because we'll have some great time at the end one of the things I'd love to do tonight is briefly speak a bit about general sustainability. We could talk for weeks on this. We could do a whole degree on this. I did. It was pretty boring. Um, no, it wasn't. I loved it. But then I also want to take a twist at the end. I've got a bit of a presentation all about fashion. It's very much a whistle-stop tour, but hopefully the idea of 
me giving speaking engagements is if I throw enough at people, something will stick. And that is, that's the thing that you can take away and that's the action that you can do. But as Jill sort of alluded to, I have been on a journey of sustainability myself. In 2014, I went and studied at the University of Dundee and I studied geography and environmental science. I did lots of colouring in, learned about rivers, volcanoes, the kind of stereotypical um, university course. It was absolutely that. And in my final year, I was feeling quite apprehensive. I was feeling like I'd learned all of this information, which I was very privileged to have the opportunity to do. I had learned all about the world, the beautiful world that we live in, the amazing um, world that works so perfectly in so many ways. But one of the things I also learned was that we are treating our planet quite badly. The way that our lives run, the way that our economies are run, the way that we do trade and produce things and have goods and services, all of these have a real impact on the planet. And currently it's happening at an unsustainable rate. So in my final year, I felt quite apprehensive thinking I've learned all of this stuff. I also didn't have a job lined up at the time. I was one of those people that kind of left it to the last minute. And it was actually on a New Year's trip that I really started to think about what the year ahead was going to have in store. So this was the year of 2018 was the year that we were coming into. And we had the Hogmanay celebrations and I was on uh, the little village called Ely on the east coast of Scotland. Uh, many of you might have been there before. It's a beautiful part of the world. And I was there for New Year's celebrations. And me and my family and our friends decided to go on a New Year's Day walk. It's something that we went on every single year. It's the kind of walk you go on and you look off into the distance and think about the year ahead and think about how wonderful it's going to be, filled with lots of great plans. I'm sure we all did it in 2020. I'm sure we all did it again in 2021. But I've cast your mind back to when we could actually do that. But the conversation turned in the group to what were, you know, what were our achievements going to be that year, the things we were looking forward to. Did anyone have a New Year's resolution? What were we thinking about? And I was just there thinking, I have no idea. I've got this final year to get through. I don't know what I'm going to be doing after. And my head was kind of just full of stuff. So I was thinking, I'll maybe just think of a New Year's resolution. What could I put my mind to this year um, to really get me through the next couple of months? But as we were on this walk, thinking about the beautiful year ahead that we all had, slowly but surely we started seeing lots of litter on the beach. Some of this you could probably put back to the night before, bits of shredded fireworks or we were on, we were at the East Coast, so, you know, probably like champagne bottles, I don't know. There was lots of things <laughs> on the beach and a lot of it was probably from the night before. But the further we walked and the further we walked away from the busy spots, we realised there was things like fishing nets and tires and pieces of packaging that had been there a lot longer and it was actually on that new year's day walk that i decided okay this is my plan for the year i'm going to try and reduce my waste reduce my plastic have a lighter impact on the planet and we just had blue planet don't know if anyone's seen that i feel that sticks with you if you've watched it so i already had this idea of you know the planet is getting some harm done to it because of us i need to do something so 2018 marked the beginning of my journey to trying to think more sustainably. And oh boy, I had no idea what I was in for. So I came home from this trip thinking, oh, this is going to be really easy. I'm going to come home, cut out plastic. I'm going to start learning about all the different ways we can be sustainable. And it's going to be really easy. But oh no, you, it's funny when you walk back into your house and you start to analyse, you start to open every cupboard, your kitchen cupboards, your bathroom drawers, your wardrobes, and you think, okay, everything's in plastic. This is going to be really difficult. You then try and do a weekly shop and you come out with an aubergine and some bread and think, well, that's not going to feed me for the week. And so I started to think more about actually how do we live sustainably? So that was the beginning of my journey. We're now partway through 2021. So I've been trying to do um, more sustainable things for a little bit longer. One of the questions I'd love to ask you to wake you up because we've been talking for 13 minutes is I would like to ask you in lockdown, what are the ways that you feel you have been more sustainable or less sustainable? So I want you to get your fingers on the keyboards. I'm used to working with kids, so I'm like finger on the keyboards, everybody. I would love you to type into the chat box. Is there anything that you think, wow, in lockdown, I've been so sustainable because I've not been doing this or I have been doing this? Or is there something that you think, oh, because of lockdown, I have been stuck doing these unsustainable things and it's really frustrating. So put the things in the chat. Let's hear some of your ideas while I take a couple of gulps of tea.
okay, we're getting them in now. Oh, these are all the positive ones. Pe people are people are being positive for, for the first one. I also want to hear, are there any things that you felt really stuck by? What are some of the things? So we've got less car travel, less food waste. That's a great one. Went to the shops a lot less. Absolutely. Gave up the car, hardly used the other one. More walking and cycling. Interestingly, cycling increased by 50% in Scotland in the last year, which is absolutely brilliant. Haven't been able to go anywhere, so less petrol, less travel for work and fun, more walking, composting, making our own bread. Oh my goodness, less takeaways, don't even miss them. Hannah, I'm not sure I'm with you on that one. I really, I miss, I miss the takeaways, I'm not going to lie. Went for walks, fewer clothes, lots of PPE, okay, interesting. Little car use, gardening, deliveries, had a lot more, absolutely. Making shopping lists, oh wow, there's so many things. Less clothes, changed to bars of soap, perfect. Hopefully you can have a scroll through these and see what people have been up to. I think it's important that when we think about sustainability, we do realise the situation that we're in. We've all had a year of lockdown. That's looked very different for all of us. Myself and my dad, we work from home. We've been buying a lot less, you know, takeaway plastics and on the go things because neither of us are in an office. We're just having lunches at home. Neither of us have a commute. We're not using our cars. We're not using public transport. We're getting many, many more walks in. It's absolutely wonderful. However, my mom, on the other hand, is still going to work and she works um, in the NHS. So she also has this problem of lots of PPE. And so she's been finding that actually in lockdown, she feels she's been more unsustainable. And I think it's really important that we take a look at the things that we are getting back to and thinking, what are some of the opportunities? Interestingly, when we talk about fashion, I think actually people, um, if you used to shop in stores, whether that was charity shops or just on the high street, if that was where you bought clothes, you've probably seen a significant reduction in the amount of clothes that you've been buying. But actually, lots of people have been buying online a wee bit more. But just looking through these things, there's loads of great things when we think about sustainability that we can hold on to. The things about food waste, the things about walking and cycling more, maybe thinking about how we travel now that a couple of the restrictions have lifted, thinking about the way um, that we travel, the way that we get around and how we can be more sustainable in that. Thinking, I love what, that people have been thinking more about food, thinking about where our food comes from, whether that's local or it's a bit more sustainable in the items and also thinking about food waste as well. So these all these absolutely fantastic ways that we can be more sustainable and before we dive into the fashion topic I want to let you know that if you have any questions about plastic, food waste, anything else about sustainability please keep them in mind we can absolutely um, chat a bit about that but before we go into the fashion thing um, I would love to tell you a little bit about why it is also really important that we're talking about sustainability this year and just briefly let you know a bit about COP26. Uh, if you don't know, COP26, which stands for Conference of the Parties, is the United Nations Climate Summit. It happens every year, except last year. It was supposed to be being held in Glasgow in November 2020. It had been postponed and it is now due to happen just a year later. So this year, November 2021. As Jill said in the beginning, I work for Tear Fund, who are an international development charity. I work in their sort of advocacy team looking towards COP. I have been in this role since COP has been postponed, so I'm very much hoping it happens. If it's postponed again, I'll just be doing this job for longer, which I love, but also it is so important that we talk about climate change and have this COP conference. What's discussed at COP? Well, COP brings all of the world leaders who are in the United Nations together and every single country has the same seat at the same table and it is a place to openly talk about how we are going to meet the targets that we need to reduce climate change. So we know that the world is warming and because the world is warming due to carbon emissions from many many different sources, fashion being one of them, we know that climate change is having an impact all around the world and even here in Scotland, we are seeing impacts of climate change. And so it's really important that we are pushing for this conference to happen, whether it's online, hybrid, in Glasgow, it's really important that we are pushing um, for our governments to think about taking action and making pledges. But also we can be pushing brands, fashion brands, the shops that are around us, and even us as individuals to be making lots of changes. 
So it's a really important year. I cannot stress that enough. With World Earth Day tomorrow, we're going to be hearing lots more about it. But this is fantastic that we've got so many people on the call getting ready to think about fashion, about sustainable fashion, and all the things that we can take away. So I'm going to share a PowerPoint uh, and I'm going to go through some statistics about fast fashion. Some of them are quite shocking or maybe hard hitting or but you've always got to start with the negative stuff. We've always got to fully understand the issues. But the second half of the presentation is going to be about some solutions, some places to point you towards, some places to get your uh, brain thinking about what it means to live more sustainably in terms of fashion. Um, but the one thing I would love to say is that when talking about fashion one of the most important things that we can keep in mind is sustainable fashion is all about less globally we just need to produce less it is of course important to think about what are our clothes made of where are they made and how are we treating the planet and people during this process but the overarching message that i hope you get from this is actually it's about less consumption and that starts with individuals and maybe if you're one of the people in the chat who has been buying less fashion this might be something that's already on your mind but as we re-enter normal i know that shops are about to open i feel like i'm catching you all just before you get the chance to run out the door it's all about thinking about the amount of clothes that we buy. So I'm going to share my screen and we have the little ramble while I get that on. Here we go. Now, could either Jill or Trish give me a thumbs up just to say that you can see that? Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to talk a little bit about fashion, the problem, and then we're going to do fashion, the solution. Um, and so bear with me while we go through this. It might seem a bit strat heavy. We could do a whole book on this and there are some book recommendations at the end, but hopefully this will just get you thinking a bit about sustainable fashion. These are a couple of screenshots I have taken from news articles that we've seen in the last year. Fast fashion and well, fashion in general has been one of the industries around the world that has actually been thriving and growing rapidly during the pandemic. Now, if you're somebody who thinks, well, I've actually not been shopping that often, it's really important to know that one of the biggest growing industries right now is online fashion. We've also seen some cases of high street shops that we've known and loved actually closing down and being bought up by these online retailers. There is a huge amount of fast fashion sold every single year, every single day. And during lockdown, it's been one of those things. I know that for many people, it has been a coping mechanism. And it is so important that we definitely don't make people feel guilty about this. We've all been stuck inside and we've all had the things that we love to do. But it's really important to kind of think about the fact that this is a huge issue and it's only something that has gotten worse over lockdown. So now that we're easing out of lockdown, we have the opportunity to go back to shops. Let's keep in mind all of this stuff. But I'm now going to go through 11 statistics that I've picked out around fast fashion, just to paint a bit of a picture about the kind of situation we're in in the world. Statistic number one, 93% of brands surveyed by the, fa the fashion checker aren't paying garment workers a living wage. There is a huge problem within the fashion industry of transparency, of being able to check supply chains and being able to give people, people a fair wage. Really important for us to think about. Often the conversation around sustainability and fast fashion often only looks at the environment, but there's also people involved in this conversation. Statistic number two, clothing production is the third biggest manufacturing industry after automotive and technology industries this production contributes more to climate change than international aviation and shipping combined so often when we think about climate change about being sustainable the first thing people say is oh what about flying what about travel what about all of this carbon that's coming out of fuel but actually the textile production, so our clothes and fabrics that we buy, it's a huge carbon emitter. It's the third biggest manufacturing um, industry and it's more than aviation and shipping combined. That is an absolutely massive number. So lots of carbon involved when we think about fashion. Number three, more than five 
hundred billion dollars worth of value is lost every year due to clothing underutilization and the lack of recycling. You'll see a couple more stats about how little we actually use our clothes, but it's because we have so much choice, so much availability. I can see my wardrobe in the corner. I know that even without me buying any clothes this year, because I haven't had the chance, I already know that's probably filled to the brim and probably has too many things in it already. But actually, this is also a huge waste of money globally. Number four, fast fashion brands. And there was a few examples here. You might have heard of some of them like Fashion Nova, Boohoo, Pretty Little Thing, Forever 21, Revolve. All of these score less than 10% on the Fashion Transparency Index. And this is an index which looks into the transparency of a supply chain. So one of the other big problems is that fast fashion is a huge industry, but we don't actually know much about the ins and outs of it. Often, if you go into a high street retailer or online ones like some of these that are suggested, it's actually really hard to trace back where your clothes were made, what they're made from and who made them. And so it's also really important to keep that in mind. Number five, one in three young women, the biggest segment of consumers, consider garments wore only once or twice to be old. So this is a shocking statistic because I'm sitting here thinking, oh, there's loads of clothes actually that I wear every single day in lockdown. I feel I wear leggings every single day, the same jumpers every single day. But actually, there are probably things in our own wardrobes that we might have only worn once or twice. But there is this growing idea that fast fashion is so disposable and it's so accessible and we can buy it in such large amounts that once we've worn something once or twice or three times, actually that to us is maybe considered old and we might throw that away or just leave it in our wardrobes and forget about it. Number six, so we know fashion is a huge carbon emitter, but actually the fashion industry is responsible for 8% of carbon emissions globally. To give you a little perspective of what 8% is, the UK, if you're taking global emissions and going by country, the UK produces 1% of carbon emissions. So fashion globally produces eight times as much as the whole of the UK as a country. 8% is massive. 8% is a huge chunk. When you think about us as a country, 60 odd, 70 million people. Seven, we're almost there. The textile sector still represents 10 to 20% of pesticide use. Some people said in the chat that they were getting into farming, they were getting into greening up their gardens. Pesticide use is a huge environmental issue when it comes to fashion. And it is one of the big things that when we think about textiles, when we think about textiles made from natural um, materials, such as cotton, there is sometimes a huge pesticide use in this. And we want to save the bees. Number eight, Three out of five fast fashion items end up in landfill. I think we can maybe agree on that if we've ever bought things that are maybe fast fashion, we maybe haven't treated them well. That statistic might not shock us, but that seems like quite a huge number. Nearly 70 million barrels of oil are used each year to make the world's polyester fibre. So that's the clothes that we wear, which is the most commonly used fibre in our clothing. However, this takes 200 years to decompose. And one of the things I would actually push back on this statistic is plastic as a material has not been invented for long enough for us to actually know how long it takes for it to disappear. So estimates of 200 years, that is absolutely an estimate. We still don't know how long. And one of the things we do know is that plastic actually just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. So it doesn't ever go away. It just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. Fashion accounts for 20 to 35% of microplastics which flow into the ocean. One of the main ways that this happens is actually through washing our clothes. So when we wash our clothes in washing machines or in basins, lots of tiny microfibers, which are classed as microplastics, flow out and into our water systems. And one of the big problems is we have now realized that this is huge and there are hundreds of thousands of these microfibers coming off of our clothes in every wash. Our washing machines are not designed to tackle this. And often a lot of um, water sources are having microplastics and microfibers flowing out. And if you imagine the chain or food chain as well, um, that's what happens when they start going up. And the final one, 63% of textile fibers are derived from petrochemicals. Petrochemicals 
being fossil fuels. So actually, plastic, waste, sustainability, fashion, climate change, all of these things are completely <laughs> interlinked. And it is remember, um, it's good to remember that when thinking of going forward. Often when we think about an issue, whether it is plastic waste, fashion or climate change, we often forget to think about how broadly this goes. But when thinking about fashion, we can think about all of these aspects. But all of these are also opportunities to do something a bit better through the choices we make for sustainable fashion. So as I said, this week is Fashion Revolution Week. Um, so we are bang smack in the middle of it. And this is a fantastic campaign that happens every single year. There's a couple of hashtags there. It's hashtag who made my clothes and hashtag what's in my clothes. And these are some great places that you can find online. You will see amazing activism happening online, demanding that we know more from the brands. So whether your clothes are from H&M, Premark or a sustainable fashion brand, someone online, no matter where they're from, this is a chance that you can demand more and demand accountability, find out a bit more about the brands. So it's great that we're talking about this this week. I thought I'd include a few of these um, statistics that the official fashion revolution we are doing. I was very excited when going through this for researching this talk because this one, for every person born since the 1950s, one tonne of plastic has been produced and less than a tenth of this has been recycled. That's shocking. It's about, I think we're sitting at 7.8 billion uh, tonnes of plastic have been produced since the 1950s. But interestingly, if you look at where this statistic is from, it's actually from a tier fund report, which is who I work for. So it's great to see that Fashion Revolution have picked up some of the stuff that um, I've worked on before in the past. But this just shows the scale of plastic. Another one, we already know this, the fast fashion industry emits the same amount um, of greenhouse gases as France, Germany and the UK. So we are the 1%, but it is humongous. And a final one, humans are now overusing the Earth's biocapacity by at least 56%. This is like living off 1.56 Earths. So the way that we are living, producing and consuming is way too much for our planet. We've got a few more bad news items to talk about before we go into the solution, but I think it's really important that we get the full picture. I want to talk about a really exciting campaign that has been happening throughout lockdown. It was just simply called hashtag pay up and it started during the COVID pandemic, I think around March. And if you look here, the pay up scheme. So on the 30th of March, Remake, who's the organization behind it, launched a petition to demand um brands to pay up as a response to reports coming out because one of the things that happened in COVID especially when lockdown first initially hit was there were many many fashion brands that decided to cancel orders to factories around the world for producing their clothes and by cancelling orders this meant that in many cases clothes that had already been produced work that had already been done went unpaid. So this was an amazing campaign that happened last year all through social media so we don't you know we don't need to leave our homes to be able to have an impact when it comes to fast fashion and campaigning and this um, was a very very successful campaign it is still on ongoing so the diagram I put up at the top was when they were at the height of it it was really buzzing when they were talking about it many of the brands have actually paid up but there are still a few who have still to do this Boohoo, Forever 21 and Victoria's Secret being just three of the examples but I really wanted to include this because this was a campaign that happened in lockdown when nobody was leaving their homes. And this all happened through Twitter and Instagram and social media. And there is a real power behind it. So it's really important that we remember that actually our impacts, our consumption impacts, they impact people all around the world. And so we need to get accountability from the brands who are the ones making these clothes and putting in these orders. Another term that you might have heard of is something called greenwashing and this was another piece of activism campaigning that happened online last year but something that you um, may be interested to know so fashion revolution the same fashion revolution as fashion revolution week every single year they release a transparency index it is a big document looking at I think it's the top 200 and 50 in terms of you know profit and production the top 250 brands and they look at their transparency the transparency that is within their supply chain 
and they rank them. So they rank every single one of these companies and they produce this report to say something. Now, last year when they released this report, the most transparent brand in the world was, I mean, I'm giving it away, showing you the slide, but it was H&M. Now, maybe some of you are thinking H&M probably doesn't seem like a very sustainable brand. So what does it actually mean? And the one reason I'd love to share this with you is because H&M, when they found out that they'd been top of the list when it came to transparency, they decided to post on Instagram. And this is what they said. H&M is the world's most transparent brand. That's us. We're the highest ranking brand in the fashion transparency index. And they used the hashtag hashtag sustainability and this is something that they posted to 35 million followers making themselves look really really great and one of the biggest backlashes that came from this was actually people saying well hold on a minute being transparent just means that you have a transparent supply chain and you can find out through all the steps what's going on it definitely doesn't mean you're sustainable because actually it doesn't mean that anything in your supply chain that's happening is good for the planet or good for people so I really wanted to include this as a way that we can all have a critical eye when looking at different brands and saying okay what does it mean to be transparent is that a good thing is that a bad thing and how can we hold to account these companies and a really interesting thing happened when H&M released this Instagram post and shared to the world that they are the most transparent brand, hashtag sustainability, a lot of online activists decided to go onto that post and say, being transparent doesn't necessarily equal being sustainable. This is very misleading. We'd like you to clarify what you mean. Some people were a bit more forceful than that, but that was the general message. And actually we ended up getting H&M to publish an apology and explain to people what they really meant. So we were holding to account, we, everyone who was involved in that, were holding a big, huge brand to account for something that they said online. So I just threw that in there because I think it's really important to have a critical eye when we're thinking about it. Because maybe someone will ask at the end, you know, recommendations for sustainable brands or, you know, our high street brands, sustainable, like we can chat about that at the end. But always have a critical eye, especially with Earth Day coming tomorrow. Every man and his dog will be talking about sustainability. So make sure you're holding them to account when you're thinking about it. I did want to throw this in as something maybe slightly controversial or something that maybe people haven't thought about before. And that is this idea of clothes recycling. It was said at the end that one of the things that's also happening right now is we are opening back up charity shops. We are opening back up clothes recycling schemes. And I want you to have a little think before a lot of us go and run and take lots of work clothes or whatever clothes we have to the charity shops. RAP um, is a really interesting organization who has amazing statistics on um, recycling. And one of the things that they were looking at is what happens when we recycle our clothes. So when we send them to a charity shop or when we send them to a recycling scheme, what actually happens? And one of the things that we realized is actually about 90% of what we donate to charity shops ends up being exported. And this is exported as a good, you know, other countries import this as something that they can sell. And this actually means that we have this lovely idea that when we give something to a charity shop, it's definitely going to get a second life and it's all going to be great. But actually, this is also part of the problem. And on top of this, the UK is the second largest exporter of clothes just behind America. And we ship more than 350,000 tonnes. That's a really hard number to get my head around. Um, and this was a start from 2014 and it's only gone up from there. And it's about 342 million pounds worth. So we are shipping off loads and loads and loads of clothes. And these clothes are just having a life that's destined in landfill. But unfortunately, it's not even a landfill on our own island it is landfills across the world we can chat a bit more about this at the end if people have questions about you know where do we put our clothes where do we send them to but it's really important that before we all go out and have a shopping spree we don't also all go out and dump all of our clothes onto charity shops because they have been inundated down in England they have there have been uh, reports and articles saying we've got so many clothes like we, we really need people to come and buy them now which is half good half bad and um, I want to throw it in there to again begin to think critically about our clothes. 
Now I'd love to chat a wee bit about the solution. Yay, positives, here we go. This is what we came for. We didn't want half an hour of all doom and gloom, but there are loads of ways that we can be sustainable through fashion. And I wanna chat um, about some of those options. So loads of different ideas here. A summer winter wardrobe. I think my mum taught me this just as an excuse so that she could have a separate piece of wardrobe in the house. And she's like, oh, that's my wardrobe for my winter clothes. Well, that's my wardrobe for my summer clothes. But actually having two different sets of wardrobes is a great way of feeling like you get a refresher. I have officially brought out my summer wardrobe. So my winter big chunk, chunky knitted um, jumpers are away. I've brought out my summer clothes. Um, some of them are a bit tight, but that's because we've been in lockdown and that's okay. But actually it feels like I've had a total refresher of my wardrobe. I have been learning how to mend. I am left-handed, which I blame um, the reason why I can't sew because nobody could ever teach me because I couldn't ever do it right-handed. But I'm learning how to mend, how to mend things that get holes in them. My jeans get lots of holes in them and I've been trying to learn. How can I give each piece of my clothing that extra bit of life that extra bit of longevity and trying to do that a bit more professionally. Uh, my mum gave me in trouble for using the wrong colour thread on all of her items that she asked me to sew and I thought it looked kind of funky but nope. Upskilling ourselves, um, thinking about the ways that we can learn not just how to sew and fix holes but actually can we take things in, can we add buttons, can we um, do them all um, in different ways and thinking about that. Stopping to buy fast fashion, I think we all know that's something that we're needing to do, but actually there's lots of ways that we can do that. Charity clothes shopping, or you might be seeing that there is a growing online version of this, places like Depop, if you've heard of Depop. You know, all of these places are marketplaces. You also have things like eBay and Facebook Marketplace and all the kind of usual ones that you might have heard of. Absolutely fantastic ways of being able to buy secondhand. And a lot of these apps now, you can be super specific. So if you want a black, floor length dress in a size 10, you can put all of that in and boom, you've got thousands of results that you can pick from. So many of these. I'm gonna chat about an app that you can look at called the Good On You app, but I'll talk about that in a second. But the two um, really interesting things that somebody told me that they think about now is whenever they buy something, they think about these two concepts, the 30 wears and the five styles. So the 30 wears is before you buy something, think to yourself, will I buy that will I wear this more than 30 times and for some people that it's like absolutely no brainer I will absolutely wear this more than 30 times but actually there's lots of instances where that might not happen I have a beautiful dress that I wore to my brother's wedding that I have wore twice since 2017 so actually at the time of me buying that if I'd asked myself Will I buy this more than 30? Will I wear this more than 30 times? The answer would have been no. And now we have a growing resource of ways that we can buy fancy dresses. You can rent dresses, um, which is a great new thing that we could do. Also suits and all the rest of it. I feel it's kind of bringing a bit more equality. I was always a bit annoyed that men could um, rent a kilt, but women had to always buy a really expensive outfit. So there are now services that you can rent things like ball dresses or you know wedding dresses. And so actually there's loads of solutions for that, but also the five styles. And this is one I've really struggled with. One of the reasons that people often don't wear clothes is because you might buy something that you think, oh, that'll look perfect with leggings, but maybe not anything else. So actually asking ourselves, can I wear this item in more than five styles or with more than five accessories or you know different ways of wearing it? Because that is really gonna help diversify and give us lots of choice. And it's kind of working on the capsule wardrobe idea. And this is something that's really challenged me because I was definitely one of those people who would buy a lovely shirt that only went with one pair of trousers and I felt like I could never wear it and it just lay in my wardrobe. So thinking about that. I am going to do a shameless plug for one of my really close friends who is called Serena. Her name is Serena Sows. She's from Glasgow, but she is the youngest ever contestant on this year's Sewing Bee, the Sewing Bee, which is on tonight in 20 minutes. Um, but the reason I plug her is because she's fantastic. She has this little Instagram called Serena Sews and she uses her Instagram platform to teach people like me who are hopeless at sewing, how to mend things, how to um, sew buttons on, fix holes, upcycle and do all the rest of it. I'm plugging her so that you can go and follow her, but also because she is the only Scottish person on the sewing bee this year. So we've got some representation. Um, 
But actually, it's people like this who are making it way more accessible about how to learn, how to sew and how to do that. And for loads of us, we might be from a generation that definitely learned how to sew in school or I might not think twice. But I know that for me, it was not something I learned growing up and it is definitely something I'm going to have to catch up on. But yeah, watch The Sewing Bee, cheer on Serena. I have no, it's all been filmed already. I have no idea where she got to. She might have won for all I know. So that's exciting. Also think about laundry, something that I love doing. There are so many different ways that we can really care for our clothes because we want to extend the life of the things that we wear. Thinking about low spin, low heat, don't overwash things. I know that it can be tempting to just chuck things in the washing basket after one wear, but really ask yourself, does this need to go in? Don't um, tumble dry if you don't have to, hang them up to dry. Think about the most eco-friendly chemicals that you can use in your wash. And you might remember that I said that um, clothes are a huge source of microfibers, microplastics. And there's a few different things that we could do. There are some really great technology now coming out. So if you're getting, if you need a new washing machine, there are ones that have filters for these, but you can also get something which I've used and had varying success with, but I think it works most times, which is called a guppy bag, G-U-P-P-Y. And it catches all the microfibers that come out of your clothes and helps them not uh, flush out of your washing machine. But thinking about our clothes, because a lot of the clothes that we wear get really battered and bruised when we wash them and we overwash them. Pants and socks, wash them every time. But actually everything else, you can probably get a few different wears out of it. And you will be really surprised to see the difference that your clothes will genuinely last longer when you start thinking about this a bit more. Oh, and a top tip that I learned, it's a bit of a random one, but it saved me a lot. I don't know if anyone else, because of lockdown, has having lots of garden visits I feel garden visits are just the thing of 2020 and 2021 and one of the things that we've had is we had this little bonfire um, in our garden because it gets absolutely freezing cold but one of the things I've found is that I've come in and my jeans always stink of burning wood you know smoke from the fire so frustrating well a top tip for you if you put your jeans into the freezer bear with me for half an hour take them out the smell is gone. I learned that tip at university. I don't know where it came from, but it totally works. So it's great for, for example, if you have a bonfire and your jeans are fresh out the wash and you don't want to wash them again. Anyway, that was just a silly little tip, but it works. This is something Scotland specific, which I think is really cool. And while you're thinking about getting out of lockdown and doing a bit more shopping, there is a fantastic new, well, I was going to say new, but it was before lockdown, but they've hardly had the chance to get going, accreditation called uh, Revolve. So you will see these on secondhand shops throughout Scotland, and it is a real seal of approval. I think it's, yeah, it says here 120 stores. I've been to tons of them in Glasgow, and it is an absolutely fantastic way to be buying secondhand, and they are ensuring quality. This doesn't just go for clothes as well. This also goes for homeware. I furnished my whole flat in Edinburgh secondhand and visiting these Revolve stores was really, really helpful because I felt like I could really trust what was inside there. And um, the staff were also super helpful. So when you're thinking about getting out and about, maybe have a look and see, have you got any Revolve certified stores? It's not just charity shops, also vintage shops have them and sort of secondhand boutiques. And so it's really, really great. Just something a bit different and Zero Waste Scotland have been incredible in leading the way with this. I also just want to put this up because I was listening to the radio the other day and there was a woman who was a manager of a charity shop down south and she said that one of the biggest things they've now had donated is work clothes. I think people are realising that working from home is probably going to stay for a bit longer. Maybe our workplace is going to get a bit more casual, but maybe you're thinking I actually need more work clothes. Well, Back when I was doing my master's, I very quickly happened to get an internship and it was in a real office. It was my first real job with Scottish Power and I thought I need to go and get some work clothes. And I had a week's turnaround to go and get a whole wardrobe. I was going to be working there five days a week for three months. And so I thought I just I need to go and get loads of stuff. My first instinct was I don't have a lot of time. I need to just go and buy things. I'll just go to Debenhams or, you know, somewhere like that. And it'll probably be a hefty fine, but I need these clothes. But actually I set myself the challenge of spending a whole day, I think it was a Saturday, to just go out to the charity shops and see what I could find. And even, this was back in 2019, I think, 
Charity shops are filled to the brim with work clothes. I think people get bored of them, want a fresh wardrobe. But one of the things that is really on my mind now is actually, as we all might be returning to work, returning to an office life, maybe some of us need to spruce up our work from work from home or work from office wardrobes. Why not try some secondhand options? All of these photos here were the pieces of clothing that I bought for this internship. All of these were somehow secondhand, whether it was from a charity shop I did steal some things from my flatmate or it was things that I already had. I had a school cardigan that was seven years old and I thought, I'm glad I'm getting another wear out of that. But actually, it was a great opportunity to really um, try and be a bit more sustainable. So something to think about if you're needing some work office clothes, head to the charity shops. They're full of them. This is the Good On You app, which is just a really um, great resource for anyone thinking about sustainability. I know that people still need to buy clothes. You still need to buy some things new. So maybe you're thinking, how can I buy something that's from a trusted company? How do I make sure I'm not listening to greenwashing? How can I hear the truth? And the Good On You app, they also have a website, is a fantastic resource. They go through every single clothing company, high street, sustainable, small scale independence, and they rate them. And they rate them on a number of different things. Let me just find my page they rate them on four different factors on people planet animals and where the information comes from they rate them based on things like their supply chain the pay of people in the supply chain the conditions the work conditions everything to do with anyone who touches a garment and um, they rate the pay for the people the second one is the planet. They look at the waste produced, energy produced, carbon, water, microfibers, chemicals, everything to do with clothing from that company. They also add in animal welfare and they look at things like third party sources. So if you ever think, oh, I wonder if this brand is sustainable, you can go and check them out. It rates them. It tells you why they got the score that they got and it goes into a bit more detail. An absolutely great kind of first place to go to if you're wanting to check on a brand. Just another one, Know the Origin is just another great organisation that goes really in depth about the transparency and ethicalness of clothing. They have great social media and um, statistics, information, websites. So I definitely go and check them out. Whenever a new brand comes out, these are always the two places that I check first for really wanting to get a bit of research. And so they're super, super helpful. To finish off, I just want to give you some examples. I could be here all day with this, but I thought I'd just give you some examples of some innovation that's happening, especially here in the UK. This is a brand called Inland Sea, who I've been working with for a few years. I was on their podcast and I've been following them ever since. I snooped their Instagram and they did this really amazing Kickstarter that was looking at, does my carbon footprint look big in this? And it was looking at the materials that we use. And they are actually trying to pioneer um, this really cool T-shirt, which is made from seaweed fiber. Seaweed fiber is a new kind of material trying to move away from the polyester that we use a lot. And it's just a really interesting way to look at the innovation that is happening within the fashion industry. There are lots of brands and small scale brands that are trying to do a good thing and trying to make it available to us sustainable clothing for an affordable price as well. And another cool thing that they actually signed up for is they don't want to just sell clothes. They also want to look at how can we solve problems. And one of the things they were looking at, a problem I didn't realize, but wetsuits are really hard to recycle. Who knew? Um, and so one of the things that they did is they, they kind of tagged up with this company called Dirt Bags and they started to recycle or kind of upcycle old wetsuits into other types of swim and surfing gear. And they were turning a complete waste product into something and giving it a new life. So there are loads of examples I could have given you 50 more of companies doing things really sustainably. Um, so don't get the fear. When I started looking into sustainable fashion, I thought I'm just never gonna buy anything ever again. Every company is awful. We just need to stop you know, buying any clothes. But actually there are some really great organizations and brands who are doing some fantastic stuff for the environment. To leave you on my final slide, one of the best things that we can also do is learn. We can come to talks like this, we can listen to podcasts, we can follow along with online campaigns, but there is a wealth of information out there. And if you're a book lover, something I've been trying to get into during lockdown, I wasn't a very good reader before, but there are tons and tons of books on fashion, fast fashion, everything from the second in from the top left, you know, this kind of a hundred tips 
for a sustainable wardrobe you know those kind of things are great if you're just wanting a coffee table thing and some really great tips and tricks to take away or you can really dive into it so all the way on the other side the right hand side you've got fashionopolis which is quite a chunky read but it's full of statistics and great stories or the one below it consumed which is actually out this year so it's not out yet and um, all of these books so you can uh, have a look at some of the titles and i'm not going to go into all of them but there is an absolute um humongous amount of literature out there to really help us all on our journey and I feel like a lot of the time once we learn these things that's when we can really educate ourselves and make some change so I thought I would just leave you with some of those you can glance over them I know that I'm sending this whole presentation to Jill anyway and it's being recorded so um there we go but I wanted to leave you with that and I now know that we have if I stop sharing we've got time for some Q&A which is fantastic um so please do feel free to pop your question in the chat or I don't know how you want to work this, Jill. Well, there's quite a few questions coming through. Um, uh, thank you very, very much. It's really, really fascinating. Um, I'm particularly challenged about wearing something 30 times. <laughs> I'm going to have we think about that as I kind of contemplate, oh, what do I want for the summer? But actually, maybe I need to look at what I've already got and then think, hmm, maybe I'll just wear that again before I wrap them. Um, so let's have a wee look at some questions we've got here. So we've got uh, one here. How can we persuade teens who are resistant to looking different from their peers away from some of the big brands? I know. I think this is probably one of the biggest struggles because actually in the beginning when I said, you know, the biggest thing we need to do is actually just consume less, that comes with a mindset shift which is if we're consuming less, as individuals, we have less variety, we have less choice. And that might actually mean that we outfit repeat, we wear the same things. So I think it's all about conversation. It's about having conversations with young people to get them on board. But it's also about thinking, what are some of the ways that we can still be creative with fashion? So it's finding those alternative ways of buying things Charity shops are stocked, filled with items, but it's also thinking how can we upcycle things? How can we take the clothes that we already have, style them differently? I think it is a huge issue though. And it's one of these things that we do need a conversation to start happening. I also know though that through my work, one of the things that I do is I work with young people and young people are, a, they are alive and awake with the issues of sustainability and climate change. And they are often the ones that are really pushing the industries to do better. I think often what we have to do though is remove ourselves because we are we are the end point of the supply chain. We are the consumers. We are controlled by the choices that we have and we are being bombarded by advertisements for fast fashion, for looking different. And so actually it's about turning back to the brands and say, you need to help us out too. You need to help us out to make better choices. And so that when we do buy clothes, they are better ones. But I know that there is a growing group of young people who are doing this. Um, actually, I did some mentoring as part of my last job at Tier Fund and I just got to meet some amazing young people and one of them had a real passion for sustainability and climate change her name is Flo and she said oh I just I've got this passion for fashion and I don't know what to do and like I really want to be sustainable and one of the things that she's actually done is all through lockdown she's been planning this humongous um, event trying to do a big clothes swap in her local area with all of her peers and she managed to get 60 young people along to do a big clothes swap and she said it was just fantastic because these are the type of people who would be constantly consuming fast fashion online and there she was leading the way doing something really quirky and unique so actually young people there's so many solutions to this and often they're the ones that really want to lead it on it as well. Laura, we've just had a question there. Thank you so much um, from um, Chloe, who's a teacher, brilliant, and um, doing this exact topic with the class and any recommendations for charities or companies to get in touch with? Absolutely. The first port of call would always say, if you're Scotland based, reach out to Zero Waste Scotland because they have an absolute, um, they've got a great network of people and they'll be able to kind of put you in touch with local organisations because there's loads of organisations helping to do things just like this, upcycling workshops, teaching people to mend things or sew things. And so Zero Waste Scotland is best port of call for being able to get those contacts. And I'm absolutely sure they would love to help you out, especially doing stuff with schools. 
Great, that's fantastic. And we've got another one here that says, um, how do you feel about H&M's latest campaign? Do you know of big companies who are attempting to make any real difference? Yes, so I would probably say that when you have a brand as big as H&M, it's nearly impossible for them to be sustainable while working to the model that they're still working on. So H&M, instead of saying, okay, the rate that we are producing clothes is way too much. We need to slow down and we need to be different. They're trying to think, in my opinion, of innovative ways of being sustainable when actually we just need them to do less. So actually going back one campaign with H&M, they decided to launch a conscious collection. Now, for many people might say, oh, isn't that a good thing? They're producing a conscious collection that gives, you know, the normal everyday people in the shops, you know, an option to do better. But one of the things they didn't do when they launched a whole new collection was take anything away. So it was just more clothes on top of the clothes that they were already producing. So it was just more. And I think with H&M just now, one of the things that they are doing is they are deciding to do this sort of buyback recycling scheme. I'm skeptical because the transparency and knowing what's in there isn't quite there yet. But one of the problems I have with it, with a buyback scheme is when you give in your products, you get back store credit. Store credit to then buy more fashion from H&M. So I'm always very wary of it. However, there are some small scale clothes recycling schemes that are happening with a lot more kind of accountability and you can find out a lot more. But I think when a brand as big as H&M do it, it just isn't going to be sustainable. I'm okay being quoted on that because they're humongous. I'm sure they can take it. <laughs> That's great. Um, we've got a couple more here. So Kareem's come in and say, what a fabulous idea. I love this idea about this clothes swap. But I think my question was going to be around as a community, what can we do? You know, what, what can we do? Not just to spread the message events like this, but what can we act, what action in a clothes sh swap shop <laughs> does sound like a great example. And then we've got another question here, just from Fiona asking, is anyone campaigning to have factory of origin on clothes labels? A great question. Wow. Do you know, that is a great question. I think most of the campaigning that is done just now, so particularly Fashion Revolution Week will be a great thing for you to look into because a lot of what they do is, is making sure that companies are being um, transparent about where their clothes are coming from so that you can trace it right back to the factory, to the garment workers, to the farm, you know, if it's, agri if it's cotton or a natural fibre. And so that's one of the things that they're doing. I haven't actually heard of anyone campaigning to put it on the label exactly, but definitely um, through that. But the one thing I will say actually about the clothes swap, these are fantastic ideas. Also great for fundraisers, if you need a fundraiser. Uh, my mom also found out that it's great because what you can do, she's run a few A's, you get people to bring a certain number of items, get a whole bunch of clothes racks, put them all around, get some mirrors, and you do it sort of like, um, I don't know how to compare it to, but what you do is you let everyone go in and put all of their clothes up. The first half of the evening is people milling around and going and having a look and you can, you know, take your pick and, and you just keep your eye on things so nobody gets it. And then you go into another room and then you sort of stagger it. So everybody gets a raffle ticket. So everyone's sitting going, I know what I want. I know what I want. And then everyone gets a raffle ticket and they pull out raffle tickets one at a time. And these women, because it was mostly women who went to it, went wild. They were running to the back when their number got called and grabbing it. But it was fantastic because it was a way of saying, if you bring five items, you can take away five items. You, you leave with something that you love, but you know that something that you've donated has also got a second home. That's such a great idea. I love that. Definitely taking away that and, and so much. Thank you so much. I'll pass back to Jill. Yeah, well, thank you, Laura. That has been just amazing. You're so enthusiastic. It's wonderful to hear. Um, now, our time is just about up, but if you would like to, to know more about Laura, she has a social media uh, kind of a presence as less waste Laura so you can follow her on Facebook or Instagram and she will you'll get regular tips on that so do follow follow her on that um, and also just a wee reminder about the Bearstead Festival because there are a number of other events this is the, the kind of the first um, web-based event that we've done but there is another one coming up with the well-being rooms uh, 
coming up very soon on the remind me lord uh, it's on the on the 12th of 12th. may which is three weeks from tonight at eight o'clock and that's part of our mental health awareness week yeah. and we've also got a, a photo photography competition going on at the moment uh, and you have to take a view the photograph from the pandemic uh, so if you go on to the Bears Den Festival website, it's also on Facebook or Instagram, you'll get some more information about that. It's green shoots. Um, and, we're all, and there will be other things especially happening over, over Mental Health Awareness Week. Uh, there are going to be a number of different events. But we really hope if this, if this takes off, that over the year we might be able to celebrate nature well-being and the environment with a number of different things and um, so I uh, do uh, follow us and uh, see what else we might be up to over the over the next few months so thank you very very much Laura it's been really amazing so thank you it really uh, challenged me to go back and look at my wardrobe and I, I do have a winter wardrobe and a summer wardrobe so my summer wardrobe is in a box in my room now so I will get it out and put the winter things away uh, uh, and um, try and make sure I use things properly. So thank you very, very much, Laura. Uh, and I do hope for the COP26 to uh, really actually happens and that uh, your your job will become more even more fulfilling than it already is. So thank you very much, Laura. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. It's been nice to see so, you. You know, off and watch the sewing bee now. <laughs> exactly. Off to the sewing bee. <laughs>